He kept the whole world waiting, but Jackson Robinson is following coach Mark Pope to Lexington after all. Is he the final piece for the Kentucky Wildcats? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Friday and welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your solo host for today, Andy Patton, and we are talking all things college basketball like we do five days a week here on Locked On College Basketball. Folks, I want to thank all of you for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners and shout out to those of you who are hanging out with us on our Discord channel. It is free to join if you have not done so yet. There is a link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. Today's episode Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use code Locked on College, and you will get $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Well, we got some news out of Eugene, Oregon, with the Oregon Ducks and Nafali Dante. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Rady Invitational Field, which has been updated. Really fun MTE that's kind of flying under the radar. We'll close out the show talking about what that field looks like, including a pair of teams that were in the Final Four last season. But we are starting the show with the news that Isaac and I were unable to bring you on our live show on Wednesday evening, the Thursday episode on audio platforms. For those of you who listened to it then, Jackson Robinson, former BYU guard, withdrew his name from the from the NBA draft process and announced his commitment officially to follow Mark Pope to Lexington, Kentucky, to play for the Wildcats. And for those of you who are hanging out with us on Wednesday evening, Isaac and I, my co-host, went live about 11.35 or so p.m. Eastern time, hoping to be able to do a live show talking about all the players who had already come back from the draft process, a few guys who stayed in the draft, and and kind of hoping to be able to react live to the final few players who we hadn't heard anything from. We were able to react live to Jameer Watkins, the Florida State uh, guard who withdrew his name from the NBA draft but is now in the transfer portal. But the main name we were waiting on was Jackson Robinson. When are we going to hear on Jackson Robinson? Is he staying in the draft? Is he coming back to school? Is he going to Kentucky? Kansas was in the mix. BYU was hoping to get him back uh, for the Cougars next year under new coach Kevin Young. And the clock hit midnight. The clock hit 12.01, 12.02, 12.03. Isaac and I were still live. We were vamping. We were chatting about some of the guys who who left the the draft and stayed the transfer portal, the Coleman Hawkins, Trevin Brazils, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually – We had to call it quits because we hadn't heard anything from Jackson Robinson. There was a lot of memes, a lot of jokes all over the internet. For those of you who were awake during that period of time, it was kind of a fun time to be on social media trying to figure out, does anybody have Jackson Robinson's cell phone number? What's going on? Why hasn't we seen an announcement yet? Uh, Next morning, still took a while. It was like around, I think it was around noon Eastern time, maybe a little bit before that. We finally get word. Jackson Robinson did submit his paperwork to withdraw from the draft process prior to that 11.59 p.m. deadline, and he is officially committed to the Kentucky Wildcats. This is a huge addition for Mark Pope's team, and and really a much-needed one. We knew that Kentucky was kind of in the mix for one more lead guard type or or, or scoring guard type, not really a point guard, but like somebody who who could be the primary scorer. They were interested in Chaz Lanier before he committed to Tennessee. They showed some interest in Wooga Poplar. We'll talk about him a little bit later in the show as well. But Jackson Robinson was always kind of the primary target. And for good reason. Robinson's six foot seven guard. He's got one year of eligibility remaining. He's played all over the SEC already. He started his career at Texas A&M way back in 2020-21. Played just 14 games for the Aggies there. Averaged about two and a half points per game. Then the next year he played at Arkansas. 16 games with the Hogs, played about 10 minutes a night, averaged about three and a half points per game. Transferred again, comes to BYU. This time BYU was in the WCC, their final year competing in the West Coast Conference. Robinson played 33 games, played about 28 minutes per night, wasn't great, averaged about eight and a half points per game, was a decent three-point shooter, provided some value for BYU, but didn't have a particularly great year. Frankly, BYU's final season, the WCC, the whole team just wasn't very good. It was a rough 
rough finish to their tenure in that conference. I think they finished fifth in the WCC. Then they move on to the Big 12, and there was very little expectation of what is this team going to do in the Big 12 after being a mid-level team in the West Coast Conference. And BYU was great last year, and part of that was the emergence of Jackson Robinson, who broke out as a key player for BYU. He came off the bench. I think he started six of the team's 33 games, but he averaged 14.2 points, two and a half boards, 1.3 assists, played about 26 minutes a night, was over 53% on two-pointers, was 35% from three, which isn't elite, but he did it on seven three-point attempts per game. He is a high-volume, effective three-point shooter. Perfect for Mark Pope's offense. That's why it worked so well last year in Provo. He's also a 91% free throw shooter. So excellent touch, excellent ability to, to score the basketball in a variety of different ways. He was the sixth man of the year in the Big 12 Conference and became a very highly sought after player. He went through the NBA draft process. A lot of people really thought he would stick. Part of the reason this, this decision was so frustrating for fans to wait for is because it really felt like he was kind of 50-50 in terms of whether he was going to stay in college or stay in the NBA draft process, potentially become a second round pick, whether he was going to come back to school or not. Ultimately, he makes what I think is probably the right decision for Robinson, goes to Kentucky. He's now going to get a chance to be kind of a featured player for this team. Mark Pope in Kentucky for them, 12 of their 13 scholarships are now accounted for. Pretty likely, not guaranteed, that they are now done, not going to fill that final scholarship spot. More and more we're seeing teams choose not to fill up all 13 of their scholarships just because the transfer portal era just means you're you're adding players who may not stick around long term anyway. So we'll see if Mark Pope and Kentucky end up using that final spot. But this feels like the last big time addition. If they do use that spot, maybe it's an international player, maybe it's a, a freshman decommit, something like that. But uh, this feels like the roster. For Mark Pope in Lexington in his first year taking over for John Calipari, this is the squad. And Jackson Robinson is going to be a big part of it. Wouldn't shock me at all if he is the team's leading scorer for Kentucky next year. And they have a lot of options in terms of how they want to formulate the starting lineup. They can do like a three-point shooting lineup, spacing it out. They can do a more defensive-focused lineup. I'm very curious how Mark Pope's going to put these pieces together. We'll look at this more in the offseason, get our guy Lance Dott from Locked On Kentucky on the show, kind of talk about his thoughts on it. My initial instinct for a starting lineup for Kentucky next year would be Kirk Creesa at the one, Jackson Robinson at the two, Otega Owe, the transfer from Oklahoma at the three, uh, Andrew Carr from Wake Forest, and Brandon Garrison from Oklahoma State kind of rounding out the front court. That would have Lamont Butler coming off the bench, Kobe Brea from Dayton coming off the bench, Amari Williams, Almanor, the transfer from Fairleigh Dickinson, and then the, the three freshmen coming in, including Colin Chandler, BYU commit. Uh, you'd also have Trent Perry and Travis Noah coming in as well. Or excuse me, Travis Perry, Trent Noah, mixing those guys up. You could also have a starting lineup where you have Kirk Creesa, Jackson Robinson, you have Kobe Brea, gives yourself some more floor spacing, Andrew Carr and Amari Williams. That's a really big three-point shooting lineup. That is like the, hey, we are going to be able to shoot the crap out of the basketball, space the floor, really make life hard for opposing defenses. Regardless of what the starting lineup looks like, I think it's pretty clear that Mark Pope has put together a team that can compete in the SEC. Is this team going to be the favorite in the conference? No, I'm assuming that's going to go to Alabama. There's going to be some other teams that are in that conversation as well. But Mark Pope had, the, had to go try to find a way to get 12 scholarship players who are capable of being rotation pieces for one of the prestigious brands in college basketball. And looking at this roster, I think he did it. It lacks a little bit of star power. Robinson helps in that regard, but again, this guy was a sixth man of the year last year. Very talented player, but if that's your star, that's kind of not typically where you would have uh, Kentucky's standards. However, the balance on this roster, the talent, the fit in Mark Pope's offense, this is an exciting team. I don't know how great they're going to be, but I think that the upside is high, and I think that the the potential for Mark Pope to really make things work in Lexington is pretty clearly there for him to be able to rebuild this team the way that he has, even if next year is just a fine season. They finish fifth, sixth in the SEC. They get a decent seed. They win their first round game. Like that feels like the kind of baseline trajectory for this team. Maybe that's going to feel like a disappointment. But I think it's going to be a sign of optimism going forward as Mark Pope gets familiar with this team, familiar with, you know, navigating the transfer portal at a higher level, recruiting at a higher level, something he didn't really do at BYU. I would be excited as a Kentucky fan right now. Jackson Robinson certainly helps, but I think that this team is going in the right 
the right trajectory. And I think that this season is going to be a, a positive one for them in Lexington. We're moving over to Eugene, Oregon, and the Big Ten, interestingly enough. Oregon big man Nafali Dante had his NCAA waiver denied. Jay Billis, oh boy, he got on social media and he shared some thoughts. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you about today's sponsor, Game Time. Folks, I live just 10 minutes away from minor league baseball team, the Hillsborough Hops. And now that baseball season is here and with multiple programs just a short drive away, I have the luxury of being able to make last minute decisions to head out to the ballpark. Fortunately for me, Game Time is the perfect place to get those last minute tickets. Prices on the Game Time app, they actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. And with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And if you're somebody who's concerned about buying tickets from third-party apps where you're worried the ticket's not going to be real, you're going to show up at the gate, get turned away, it's embarrassing, nobody wants to be in that situation, what I can tell you is that Game Time has the most flexible customer service policy in the entire ticketing industry. And personally, I love having that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Folks, you're looking for a minor league baseball game? Two tickets, twenty five bucks. Download Game Time. Use that promo code. You can go to that game for five dollars. Again, that's Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, folks, segment two, still Andy Patton, still here on our Friday edition of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. We talked about Jackson Robinson pulling his name out of the NBA draft deadline, not letting anybody know for about nine hours, and then committing to Lexington to join Mark Pope at Kentucky. I want to switch gears here and talk about the an NCAA waiver, something we haven't heard as much about lately because players are generally able to do whatever the heck they want because of of multiple court cases. We're in a situation where the NCAA hasn't really been able to enact a lot of authority on college basketball in the last year or so, really on college athletics in the last year or so. But they did. On Thursday morning, we heard the announcement. Nefali Dante, big man from Oregon, who's been there for quite a while, very talented player, had his hardship waiver for an extra year of eligibility denied by the NCAA. Now, Dante is applying for was applying for a hardship waiver because he had multiple injuries that have really curtailed his ability to play. He's only played a couple of full seasons in Oregon, despite having been there since 2019. In the 2019-20 season, Dante played 12 games. In the 2020-21 season, which was the COVID year, the year that everybody got an extra year of eligibility, Dante only played six games. So in his first two years in Eugene with the Ducks, Dante played just 18 games. After that, he finally got healthy. 21-22, he played 32 games. 22-23, he played 31 games. And then last year, he played 22 games. He missed a, a little about a month or so earlier in the season, came back, played extremely well down the stretch for the Ducks. All told, that's 103 games for Nefali Dante in his career. Four full seasons, if you assume an average of 30 games per year, would be about 120. So Dante has played less than four full seasons. And again, he should have a COVID year of eligibility. If you extrapolate and you assume that Dante should be given five years of eligibility based on him being an active college basketball player during the COVID years, you could look at the number of games he's played and determine that he should probably get a hardship waiver. It is more complicated than that. And it should be more complicated than that. But fundamentally, that is why there is frustration. Frustration for Oregon fans, frustration for college basketball fans, frustration from Jay Billis, who went off on social media about this. He was pissed that Nefali Dante did not get his hardship waiver. I'm going to just read the direct tweet from Jay Billis because he he wrote it out and said it better than I could have. So we're just going to use his words right here. This is the direct tweet from Billis. He says, quote, The NCAA's treatment of Oregon's Nefale Dante is simply outrageous. This young man is everything the NCAA claims it wants in an athlete. Dante has been injured throughout his career and has played two full seasons less than players like Armando Baycott, throwing strays at a North Carolina guy. What do you what do you know, Jay? Uh, yet he's denied an additional year due to injury, ending his career absurd. Dante is a model athlete and person, wants to come back to play and advance his education, and has never asked his school for anything. When the NCAA says athlete welfare, it rings hollow. 
The NCAA needs to do the right thing, allow Dante his additional year immediately. Strong words from Jay Billis. I don't disagree with anything that he's saying. This feels like a situation where sometimes the NCAA gets so in the weeds of, of rule following and procedure and just kind of starting to treat every situation like it's on a spreadsheet or that they're all the same and, and kind of forgetting to look at the human element. And I do not envy the compliance office for the NCAA. There's a lot of tough decisions you have to make. You get a lot of sob stories. It's difficult to navigate all of that. But at the end of the day, I think the step back needs to be like, what are we, what are we doing by denying this? Like, what are we, like, what is the accomplishment for not allowing Nefali Dante to play an additional year of basketball? I get that other teams in the, in the big 10 now are going to be, would be unhappy seeing Dante back. He's an experienced guy. I know a lot of fans are like, Oh, we're tired of 25 year olds playing college basketball, whatever. Here's the deal. Dante has played less than four years worth of basketball games in his career. He should have five years. I Again, I know it's more complicated than that, but that is kind of the baseline situation here. You're taking a kid who wants to be in college, who wants to be getting his education, who wants to be playing for Oregon, who is a, a good kid. He hasn't been in trouble. There's no you know, issues with him. And you're telling him he can't continue to play. I, I don't – I just think that whether it's the rules, like – whether the procedure and the policies have been followed correctly, and that's the verdict the NCAA comes to. If that's the case, reevaluate the policies and procedures. How do we get to a point where this is a player that doesn't get to continue to play college basketball? It just doesn't make sense. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here on out because everybody is just suing the NCAA, and the NCAA keeps losing. They're picking up L after L after L and eventually are just pretty much powerless. The recent thing we heard is that players who have been mandated to sit out a year previously per old rules, they may be able to get that year of eligibility back. There's just, the NCAA does not have a leg to stand on on any of their the rules that they're putting in. Be interesting to see if Dante lawyers up, if he tries to take this to court. I think he's going to, and I think there's a real chance that he wins. Timing wise, I don't know how that's going to line up. I don't know if he'll be back in time to play for Oregon at the start of the season, what that might look like. It's a big blow for Oregon's front court. We've talked about it from the Dante side of things and from the NCAA perspective. For Oregon, they lose a player who averaged 17 points and nine and a half boards last year. Dante also averaged 1.9 blocks, 1.7 steals, and 1.6 assists. He shot 70% from the field. I feel like Dante is really good. He's a really dominant low post back to the basket score. He's got great footwork. He's got great touch around the rim. He's a good shot blocker. He's a great rebounder. He is a talented player. And Oregon's probably not going to have him to start the season. We'll see if there is any kind of legal ruling that potentially lets him play at least part of the season. At this point, it's very fresh. We don't know the details. But for Oregon, Nate Biddle becomes their starting center. He's a very oft injured big who, who's been productive at times, but isn't necessarily an elite guy. If he's your starting center, I think you're not feeling super great about the direction that that goes. I'll be curious if they look for more transfers, especially if they don't feel confident about Dante returning for this team. They've already added three transfers, but none of them are bigs. TJ Bamba comes over from Villanova after starting his career at Washington State. Raheem Moss comes over from Toledo. He's a very talented guard. They also get Brandon Angel coming over from Stanford. He's like a wing, but he's not really a four or a five. They do get KJ Evans coming back, guy a lot of people thought was going to be a one and done last year, ended up playing very well, but is going to come back and take on a bigger role for this team. There's still going to be great Jackson Shellsteads in the mix. I like the transfers they got. I think this is going to be a, a good team for Dane Altman and the Ducks. I think they're going to be competitive in the Big Ten, but they'd be in a lot better shape if they had Nefali Dante. They'd also be in a lot better shape if they land the other player that they are pursuing right now, and that's Wooga Poplar out of Miami. Poplar's been in the transfer portal for a while. He's been pursued by Kentucky until they let, just landed Jackson Robinson. Kansas was in the mix for Poplar after they lost Johnny Furphy. We'll see if they're still pursuing him. They obviously have already brought in A.J. Storr and Ryland Griffin and Zeke Mayo. It's a lot of talent at the wing positions. I'm not sure. Poplar would be a bit of a luxury for Kansas, although certainly uh, I'm, I'm sure they will continue to pursue him. But we've also seen Villanova in the mix. Poplar's not a luxury for Villanova. He is a desperately needed addition for the Wildcats. He's a Philadelphia native. If they can't land, if they can't bring this kid home when they have, they already lost Max Scholga back to VCU, this Villanova team is in dire straits. They got good news earlier this week with Eric Dixon pulling himself out of the draft process, returning to the Wildcats. If they can also land Wooga Poplar, that's a great week for Kyle Neptune and a desperately needed one. But Poplar's going to Oregon. He's visiting Oregon. Let <laughs> me clear it up. He's visiting Oregon. We will see if he ends up committing to the Ducks or not. Wooga Poplar, TJ Bamba, 
That's a really good group of guards to get in. It's also a bad day for Villanova. They already lost Bama. That didn't, they're not getting him back. But to have Poplar also go to Oregon, woof. There's going to be some, some animosity between the Wildcats of Villanova and the Oregon Ducks. Uh, but this is a, a, an intriguing transfer to watch. If Poplar does that up at Oregon, he helps kind of replace Jermaine Cousinard, who was very good for Oregon last year, particularly in the NCAA tournament when he had that monster game against his old school South Carolina. Very interested to see where Poplar ends up. Very interested to see if that does end up happening in Oregon as they transition into the Big Ten next season. Well, folks, the Rainy Children's Invitational Field is set. It is a four-team MTE. We're going to talk about how it has two of last year's final four teams after they adjusted the field and why this is going to be one of the sneaky, better MTEs during Feast Week next season. All that coming up in just a second. All right, folks, segment three, still any Patton. Still locked on College Basketball Podcast, closing out the show today after talking about Jackson Robinson committing to Kentucky and Nefale Dante having his waiver denied by the NCAA to play another year for the Oregon Ducks. Want to talk about a, a press release that I received that a handful of other people, it's, it's been a conversation as this Rady Children's Invitational Field. If you haven't heard of it, it's in its second year. It was played last year for the first time. It is a San Diego-based tournament during Feast Week and MTE. And it's played at UC San Diego's campus. Beautiful arena there, by the way, for UC San Diego. And the field this year is fantastic. It was initially announced in 2023 that the field for this upcoming season was going to be Purdue, BYU, Notre Dame, and Arkansas. Two of those teams remain in the field, Purdue and BYU. Notre Dame and Arkansas have both dropped out. They are replaced by NC State and Ole Miss. For Notre Dame, they drop out to join the Players' Era NIL Tournament. We've talked about that quite a few times on the show. If you're unfamiliar, it is a new MTE based in Las Vegas that will start this year. It's an eight-team field. Next year, they're projecting it to be a 16-team field. The reason being, every team that participates gets $1 million in NIL money for their team. The team that wins is expected to get another million as well bunch of high profile programs. Oregon is in this tournament for next year. Notre Dame, again, they they dropped out of this field, the Rady Children's Invitational, in order to join the Players Era NIL tournament. Uh, we see Alabama's in it, Houston's in it, Creighton dropped out of Battle for Atlantis to join this tournament. It is going to be a huge field for the Players Era next year. And then again, the year after that, it's expected to be expanded all the way to 16 teams. Arkansas, meanwhile, they drop out just because of the coaching change. Eric Musselman is who signed up for this. Eric Musselman loves California. He's a West Coast guy. He loves being in California. When he was in Arkansas, he had an opportunity to join an MTE where he'd be spending his Thanksgiving week in San Diego. He said, you bet. Sign me up. I am pumped about that. Now, guess what? He gets to spend all his time in sunny Southern California as he's the new head coach of the USC Trojans. John Calipari took over and said, I don't want this. I don't want this tournament. I'm out. Scrapped it from the calendar. So the, the creators of the Radius Ch Children Invitational had to find two spots to fill. Fortunately, they already had Purdue, def, you know, just coming off of being in the national championship at one of the most premier programs in college basketball the last couple of years. They already had BYU, which is looking great as a team that has hired Kevin Young. They've brought in some of the highest profile recruits in school history. I think three of the top eight incoming freshmen in program history have committed to BYU in the last month. This program is in really good shape as they're in the Big 12, as they have a new coach, as they got some extra NIL funds to toss around. Purdue and BYU is a really good foundational spot to be when you're trying to create a four-team MTE. They go out and get NC State, a team that didn't have a great regular season last year, but guess what? They did what they needed to do in the ACC tournament, rattled off five straight games, went all the way to the Final Four, lost by 13 to Purdue in that Final Four game, getting NC State for this tournament. Even though it's going to be a new-look team, Kevin Keats is losing a lot of his talent. Uh, DJ Burns is out the door. they got a handful of other guys who are not going to be back for that program who were fantastic last year. It's still a quality brand. It's still a well-known basketball team. And the potential, we haven't found out the actual matchups yet, but the potential for a rematch between Purdue and NC State, they're going to find a way to make sure that game happens, whether it's the first game they schedule or, or however it's going to work. That's a game that's going to happen. And that's going to be a, a heavily watched game. You also get a good Ole Miss team coming into this conference or coming into this event as well. Uh, Chris Beard, really successful start of the season last year. They're really good in the non-conference. I think they're one of the five last remaining undefeated teams. Struggled a little bit once they got into the SEC, but again, SEC is really, really good. So not exactly uh, anything to be ashamed of for Chris Beard and the Rebels. I think 
uh, all in all, a successful first year for him with Ole Miss. They've had some success in the transfer portal so far this offseason. They get Matthew Morrell back, a uh, player who was in the draft process who withdrew and returned to school. So uh, maybe not the flashiest name here, certainly, but a, a quality program. And if you're looking to replace Notre Dame, Notre Dame's a bigger brand, but Ole Miss is a better basketball team. And I expect Ole Miss to be a better basketball team next year. So they got better by adding Ole Miss into this field. They get NC State and Arkansas. It's hard. Arkansas is probably going to be better next year with John L. Davis, with Jonas Adu, with the, the squad that they brought in. But they're a hard team to pin down right now. Uh, I think NC State's going to be quality. I think Ole Miss is going to be quality. And I think the field here of these four teams, it's a really good field. I'll be interested to see how, how these kind of events continue to proceed because – MTEs as a whole, and we've talked about this on the show already, but worth reiterating, they're going to change. The Players' Era NIL tournament has already made a massive shift in the sense that tournaments that aren't paying NIL money are going to fall behind tournaments that are. The Players' Era NIL tournament is not going to be the only tournament that offers a lump sum of NIL money to every participating team. That is going to continue to happen. More tournaments are going to start doing that. We're also seeing a shift where the eight-team, three-game tournament is going by the wayside. Teams do not want to participate in a three-game tournament anymore because, for many of them, their conference schedules are expanding. The Big Ten is getting bigger. The SEC is getting bigger. The Big 12 is getting bigger. That's where a lot of your premier basketball programs are. And if they're feeling like they don't have as many non-conference games to schedule, they don't want to commit three of their games to a tournament especially if they could go, if they're not getting paid, the players aren't getting paid for said tournament. This is why Atlantis lost Creighton. This is why you're going to see Maui is going to suffer. Atlantis is going to suffer. ESPN Events Invitational, they're going to suffer until they make adjustments and they either cut down to being a four-team, two-game field with multiple regions, multiple brackets. I think that's the, the wave of the future for these events. And then you'll see more one-off events like this one. The Ratty Children's Invitational, which is raising money for a, a nonprofit in San Diego. It's uh, it's a quality event, but it's four teams, two games, four teams. That's it. I think that's the wave of the future. I think we'll see more events like this crop up. I think eventually the majority of them will have NIL money tied to them. Haven't seen that become a huge thing yet. But I think a lot of places are going to wait to see how this thing goes with the Players Era Tournament. If it goes successfully, if people watch, if the money gets paid out. If the players are happy, if the coaches are happy, I think that becomes the wave of the future. So again, we'll continue to keep you updated on the MTEs as we start to get those schedules finalized and kind of get a sense of what our feast week is going to look like this year, what some of those events are going to look like. It's always fun to kind of look at some of the matchups that we're going to see, but I think a part of that conversation will continue to be how much these MTEs are going to change dramatically in the next two or three years going to wrap it up for me today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast and for the week. Thank you so much to those of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remember to join us on Discord where we're talking college hoops 24-7 throughout the weekend as well. Folks, have a fantastic weekend. As always, apologies to the lawyer family as they'll now be in this event at Purdue. Let's go Wildcats! Kentucky picking up a big one. And until Monday, peace out.